remind you as well, next Sunday is our normal Sunday for communion. So if you would like to participate in communion with us, please plan on being prepared with uh, juice or something and some bread just so you can participate in communion. Please hear this greeting this morning. Sing praises to God, O you saints, and give thanks. God's holy name. We exalt you, O God, for you have restored us to life. We may cry through the night, but your joy comes in the morning. You hear us, O God, and you are gracious in our distress. You turn our mourning into dancing. Our souls cannot be silent. O God, our Savior, we give thanks to you. May they sense your presence 
with them during their darkest days. May they sense the assurance of your love and your grace in the wee hours of the night when they wake up un unable to sleep because they're missing that special person. We continue to lift our essential workers to you, Lord, the hospital workers, the medical staff, the EMS, our police and fire department. We pray for our teachers, Lord, who constantly are having to change courses in mid stream, not knowing from one day to the next that they'll be in class with their students or facing a blank computer screen. Continue to work with them as they seek to teach our children and our young people the things that they need to know to, to be better versions of themselves. Be with each one of us this day, O oh Lord, as we confront one of the most important questions in your word. Enable us to answer, even to answer as Peter did. Speak to us anew from your word and grant us your strength for this day and all the days of God before us. For we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Which taught us to pray together as the children of God, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for everything. Amen. Scripture this morning is from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, reading verses 41 through 69. This takes place right after the feeding of the 5,000 by the Sea of Capernaum. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, and whose mother and father we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus said. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written by the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna 
from heaven and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling too about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. These words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The controversy was heating up. Questions and accusations were swirling on every hand. The Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious people, took issue with Jesus when he began to talk about my father, eternal life, coming down from heaven. On more than one occasion, they tripped over his teachings. They pointed to his background, his lineage. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose mother and father we know? They would not hear his teachings. They could not accept his lessons. It went against everything they knew, everything they taught. Some of the fringe followers turned away too, swayed by the arguments of the Pharisees. They had heard other prophets that claimed to be from God. They had their hopes raised by other miracle workers, only to have them dashed when their heroes were disproved by the religious authorities or run out of town or killed by the Romans. They had followed Jesus everywhere, wanting to hear more struggling to reconcile what their eyes saw and their ears heard, wanting to believe, but not quite able to take the leap of faith that it required. They knew there was something different about this Jesus. They'd heard about the miracle. Some of them had even participated in one they were there on the grassy plain beside the Sea of Galilee. They ate their fill of the bread and fish provided by one small boy's lunch. They saw the baskets full of leftovers that the disciples picked up, and they walked away wondering who this prophet really was. They came back the next morning wanting to hear more. But they struggled to make sense of his parables, to understand his teachings about heaven, the bread of life, his true identity. And this talk of eating his body and drinking his blood, what was that? It made no sense. And so they turned away. Like all mankind from the beginning of human history, they were looking for someone to be in charge. They wanted an authority figure, a king, a prophet, a priest. They wanted someone who would carry their troubles, point out the right path, direct their future. Their forefathers in the Old Testament times had spoken of God's Messiah who would come to rescue them. 
to save them from the world, from themselves. Like their ancestors before them, they prayed daily and fervently that the Anointed One would come and make the world right again. But instead of riding in on a white horse and destroying the Romans with a wave of his hand, Jesus was talking about suffering and dying. He was talking about giving his flesh and blood, like the manna from heaven that their ancestors had survived on in the wilderness. It was strange talk that made no sense. And so many of those who had been following for a few days or a few weeks turned back to their homes, their families, their jobs, their regular life. Left alone with the original twelve, Jesus said, You don't want to leave too, do you? It was a logical question to ask. The others had seen and participated in the feeding of the five thousand. They'd been traipsing all over the countryside wanting to hear what Jesus had to say. They hung on his every word, some asking questions, seeking deeper meaning, clearer answers. But now the crowds had dwindled. There was a lull. And Jesus had to know if the twelve who remained shared the same uncertainty, the same doubts. They were all looking for a savior, for the Messiah. They wanted someone they could trust with their futures. Someone who cared about their fears and sufferings. Someone who would listen to their tales of woe and wipe their tears of sorrow. They wanted someone to trust. And Jesus stepped forward and said, come to me. All you who are weary and overburdened and I I will give you rest. But now the burning question was, is this the one? Consider what they knew about the character of Jesus the Christ. Even those who have the most to say against Christianity are hard pressed to say anything negative about Jesus. Look at him in the context of the time in which he lived, pure amid impurity, living a hard, narrow life among working people, stoned, persecuted, harassed, humiliated, buffeted on every hand. According to the author of Hebrews, he was tempted in all points like we are, but without sin. Through it all, Jesus remained gentle, always giving, filled with pity for the downtrodden and love for all. He never spoke an unkind word about anyone. Well, he did call the Pharisees white and sepulchers. But even Pontius Pilate, as he sentenced him to death, was forced to say, I find no basis for a charge against this man. The King James says, I find no fault in him. Jesus had the most spotless reputation in history. Where else do you turn for answers? To whom will you turn for guidance? for support, for nurture, for the truth. Do you have someone else in mind? Is there someone more perfect? Look at the teachings of the Master. Mankind has always been looking for answers to the mysteries of life. Who will solve these riddles for us? Who has the answers? Who can tell us who we are? what our destiny is. No philosopher can tell us they're human just like we are. 
But Jesus tells us something different. When he speaks, he tells us who we are. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, John tells us. And he tells us who and what we can be. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And what about the influence of this one called Jesus? Of all the noblest lives and greatest characters that have ever walked on this planet, it's been Christ and his followers who have had the greatest impact for good. If we were to attempt to name all of those in the catalog of greatness and goodness, it would take hours, days even, to begin to make the smallest dent. Jesus the Christ was responsible for these people being who they were. They asked him for help. They were obedient to him because they wished to be, not because he demanded it. He was the one who molded their lives. They were historical figures of greatness because they depended on a master planner. And they lived their lives according to his perfect plan. They asked what it was he desired them to do, and they did it. Like their master, they said, not my will, but thine be done. This was their prayer, their working philosophy in life. It was what made a difference in their lives and in their world. Would you go in a different direction? Would you look for some other guidance, some other counsel? Jesus turned to his followers as the fringe element fell away and said, will you also go away? It was Peter who answered him, simply and directly, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Why did Peter answer that way? What was it that he felt? What was it that he had seen that made him so certain that Jesus was who he claimed to be? Peter had been at his side since the beginning. The first one he called. He was one of the Lord's closest confidants. He had seen the miracles firsthand, up close and personal, every one of them. He had listened to him preach. He had heard the parables. He watched the people as they came to Jesus. He could see it in their faces, their eyes aglow with hope and the possibility of change. They pressed forward on every hand. The crippled were walking, the blind were seeing, the deaf and dumb singing his praise. Even the dead were raised to life again. It was a simple response to the master's question, Lord, to whom will we go? Indeed, to whom could they go? There was no other one like Jesus. Peter had seen the world without Jesus. And that reality was too much for him. He faced this great alternative. Does he stick with the master or go back to his world of nothingness? and pain. Go back to Judaism, to the promises of the Pharisees that had no substance, to the prayers of his ancestors that still had not been answered. Go back to the uncertain struggle of being poor and enslaved by a foreign government that didn't care if he lived or died as long as he paid his taxes. 
go back to the darkness of sin and jealousy, of anger and hatred, of fear and doubt? Peter had seen the other side of hope. He could give no other response. Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Consider this. To whom can you go when the burden of sin and guilt rests heavily upon you? When you're loaded down, bent to the point of breaking under the strain of it all, who will take away that burden? To whom will you go? Nature can't forgive us. The environment, our heredity, even our family and friends are powerless to set us free from the despair of failure and the guilt of the past. How can we change? How can we become better versions of ourselves? How can we become the people we were created to be? Once we become aware of the nature of Christ, once we turn our eyes in the direction of the cross, we begin to see ourselves in a different light. It's like walking into a large room where the sun's beams are streaming through the windows. In that beam, we can see millions of motes of dust. We didn't even know they were there until the sunbeam shone on them. We thought we were breathing pure, unadulterated air. But now we can see the dust, the dirt, the pollution. In the same way, in the light of the Son of God, every speck of dirt and grime in our lives is revealed. We thought we were good enough until we see ourselves through God's eyes. We see the need to change. We see the actions and attitudes that are bringing us down. We see the hope of something new, something better, something perfect. To whom shall we go for a push towards a better life? Maybe you've taken a good, long, hard look at your life and you know you need help. You've been trying to change. You want to change. But you know deep within yourself you just don't have the strength, the power, the ability to change from the inside out. We've had a glimpse of what that life can be. We know that if we stick close to Jesus, we'll begin to turn away from our old attitudes and actions. We'll be done with those friends that want to drag us back down to where we used to be. By looking at the cross, we discover vast new horizons in our lives. We're beginning to look up and out and find there's so much more that we've been missing by not reaching out and serving others in the love and spirit of Christ. To whom shall we go? Once we've tasted the new life in Christ, once we've experienced his forgiving grace, once we've found the truth of our divine inheritance and eternal destiny, once we sense the power of his guidance and love, indeed, to whom shall we go? Let us pray. Holy Father, that is the question. To whom shall we go? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Without him we're lost alone in self-centeredness, lifeless. Open our eyes to the ever-present reality of the gift of yourself to our world. 
and allow our personal world to be ultimately changed by his presence. In his holy and perfect name we pray. Amen. May the strength and power of our redeeming Lord Jesus Christ be with you, strengthening you to be all that he calls you to be. Amen. <laughs>